my talk is uh, to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face which are astronomical in this era of atomic scale chip manufacturing. There's a few big words I've used here, but I'll try to explain what the challenges are. We'll talk about how we leverage AI and HPC in some of these solutions. One ask for all of you is try and keep this interactive. It's a lot more fun for me that way. I give this talk fairly often. Some of you have probably heard some of my talks before. So keep this interactive. Any questions, just feel free to you know raise your hand. And that way it's more fun for me. I can take it wherever we think uh, you know, you're understanding. Okay. So a little bit about me before I go. A little bit about me before uh, we get going. So I too was actually a student of IIT Madras. I got my undergraduate in computer science in 2005 from IIT Madras. Thank you. Okay, so I too got my undergrad from IIT Madras. Uh, I was a student here uh, at Alak and uh, that's me getting my degree from the then director, uh, Professor Anand. I got my PhD at UIUC following that picture of me outside my favorite space in Navarna Champagne, my coffee shop where I faked to write my thesis for quite a while. I then worked at Intel designing some chips. I've done some software that today powers quite a bit of the Prime Video and Disney Plus that you enjoy at home. I've been adjunct faculty at IIT Madras from 2016 to 2020, where in the computer science department, I've taught a few courses, including parallel computer architecture. I even today come and teach a little bit of GPU programming with Professor Rupesh. And since uh, 2021, I joined KLA as the director of the Advanced Computing Lab at IIT Research Park. So the focus of my lab and quite a bit of work that we do at KLA is to try and make sense really of this world of image processing and AI and how we can leverage high-end computing like GPUs and accelerators to actually make this real and how we make it actually come to life to affect pretty much what we think is every single person's life on the planet. So I'll talk a little bit about this today. I'll talk about the algorithms. I'll talk about acceleration and how we think we're trying to make sense of it. So KLA as a company is actually affecting you in more ways than you realize. So this slide, assuming the clicker does the trick, shows you several computing elements, several peripherals that you use in your daily life, whether it be the computers that you use, the tablets, your phones, your gaming devices, robots that power and you know make sure our houses are clean and servers in several restaurants. KLA actually has an integral part to play in the manufacturing and the delivery of every single one of these components. In fact, we say that KLA, because of KLA, virtually every single electronic component that's produced in the world is touched by KLA technologies. This is because KLA is instrumental in the manufacturing of semiconductors. And therefore, every single semiconductor that's manufactured in the world has been seen by a, by a KLA tool, has been verified by a KLA tool, enabling you to do the great things that you do of creativity. Now, now that I've said this, how many of you have heard of KLA? Can I see a show of hands? I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed. Normally, this question is muted with the response. I normally get a less than 10%. I'm getting almost 50%. It's great to hear, right? So it means our marketing is doing the right job of spreading the message. So here's what I'm going to talk about today in the talk. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of background of uh, semiconductor process control, which is what we do at KLA. We'll talk to, we'll, I'll talk about what that actually means. And then I jump into some of the fun stuff, which is the real technology behind it. We'll talk about how we are using big data to see really tiny things. And I'll show you, when I say tiny, I really mean tiny and you'll understand what I mean. And we'll talk then about how we are leveraging AI to solve these problems of trying to see big, we are trying to see tiny things and how we are making rubber meet the road by leveraging HPC. That's going to be the you know breakup of the talk. Again, just to reiterate, any questions, anything that you disagree with me, I love it when my audience disagrees with me. It's more fun that way. Just feel free to raise your hand, interrupt me and we'll have a chat. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what semi-process control actually is. So just to get terminologies right, here are three pictures clarifying what a wafer is, what a chip is, and what a chip in package is. So most of you have probably seen what we call a chip in package, which is the picture on the third on the right, which is when you go out and you assemble your own computer, you go buy an Intel CPU or an AMD CPU, what you actually get is a chip in package. That's what is actually sold in the market. But the way that chip in the package actually shows up is you first you have to get the chip. The chip typically that powers your computer today is the size of your thumbnail. It's about, that's actually the size, that's pretty much it. 
the, so the one that powers your phone is about quarter of that size. That is the heart of the system, right. So the chips come from what is called a wafer. A wafer is a circular disc 300 millimeters in diameter and on a wafer multiple chips which are identical are manufactured. So the wafer is the minimum for lack of a better word demographic on which chips are manufactured. Once you manufacture them on the wafer, wafer is typically made of silicon, you cut them, dice them, make them into chips, package them and you sell them as end products. While the consumer is primarily working on chips in package, KLA's role is in pretty much every single step of the way from the manufacturing of the wafer to putting it into a chip in package and shipping it out, KLA is involved. I will talk to you about how this actually happens in the upcoming slide. So this slide actually shows a very simplistic depiction of how a chip is manufactured right? and this is really the crux of what KLA does. So on the left side you see what is coming in as wafers, wafers are again like I said 300 millimeter diameter so it is about yay big 300 millimeters, it is a circular disc made of pure silicon and it is made actually from sand, you actually melt sand in a furnace, you grow the silicon cluster uh, structure and you cut it into discs very simple. Your reticles are, think of your reticle as a negative mask, like how many of you have done photo development using H2O2 and things, probably nobody right, I have done it when I was a very small kid, long time back. So a reticle is basically the negative mask of your circuit that you have designed in your classes. Those of you who have done circuit design, you know that the circuits finally when they are going to get manufactured, get manufactured as layers, reticle is a negative for every single layer you want to manufacture. The first step is to check that the quality of the wafer and the quality of the reticle is good. What that means is for a wafer, it needs to be perfectly flat. When I say perfectly flat, I mean perfectly flat. You cannot have even nanometers of variation from one edge to the other. It cannot be warped, it needs to be perfectly flat. Then what you do is you start with the wafer and typically your transistor is made up of three or four layers of different substrates and then you have metal layers which actually on which you draw the different circuits of connection. So you do what is called deposition where you take a particular chemical, you deposit on this on this particular wafer, then you do litho, I think of litho like you take a laser gun and you cut it depending on what circuit you want to draw right. So to do the litho you need the reticle because that is what the mask is right, so the negative, so you, you cut which lines are shown. Then you remove the reticle, then you do etch where your laser has just basically just shown you the path, you actually take a grinding axe and you grind it down, it sounds very crude. But this is actually what happens, it is a very you know a very very microscopic scales right and then you do what is called CMP which is chemical and mechanical polish where you have cut it, it is going to be residue so you have to clean it, first pour some chemical over it, you clean it, then you do mechanical polish where you actually polish the entire wafer so that it is smooth okay. That is one layer, rinse and repeat and you do this about 100 to 150 times, you get one single wafer full of dyes completely manufactured. Once you have finished all that, it goes out to test on the right side and it is only when it goes out to test when the entire circuit is drawn that you can actually electrically test the entire wafer or a single chip in the wafer. But it takes anywhere from 3 to 6 months from when the wafer starts as a naked wafer to when you have a fully finished pattern wafer that is ready for electrical testing. And in those 3 to 6 months, if you have done one single mistake there is one error, every single wafer and every single die on every single wafer has had that error for the last 6 months and it is completely wasted. So naturally you do not want to wait for 6 months to test it. So what you do is at each stage you inspect is the reticle clean, is the wafer clean, after depositing one layer is that layer clean, have I made any mistakes, after depositing the second layer did I do something when I you know cleaned it. Did I mechanically polish it down too much? Is there shots that is created? After depositing a third layer, did my first layer have some impact because it is waiting, weights adding on top, right? What KLA does is for every single step of the way, we have what we call tools, right? The tool is typically about half the size of this room that we are talking about and for every single step, we have a different tool that specializes at ensuring that that particular step is happening correctly. And there are two types of tools, one tool is called a metrology tool, one is called inspection, I will talk a little bit about it. But fundamentally what is process control is when you are manufacturing, you want to make sure that the process with which the manufacturing is happening is accurate. But the definition of accuracy is also loose because in the angstrom era as you approach 
you know, 5 nanometers, 1 nanometer and sub 1 nanometer manufacturing, what you try to draw as a straight line is no longer a straight line, it is jagged because of quantum effects. So, you expect to draw a straight line in the circuit, but it is a jagged line and up to certain degree of variation can be tolerated by the circuit. So, you do not know what exactly is okay and what is not. So, you want to control the process to make sure that it is not too varied as opposed to being a straight line. That is why we call it process control, but you want to control the process. So, the idea is that the manufacturing is not perfect, right? The etching is never perfect, like I said, quantum effects. So, the process control tools ensure that though you are manufacturing it not in a perfect way, you get devices that still function that do not happen. Any questions so far? The idea clear? Okay. So, what I showed you is just the one step which is in the middle here, which is IC manufacturing. However, there are many things that feed this. Like I said, on the left side, you see the reticle manufacturing, there is wafer manufacturing. Right? And for the IC manufacturing, there is materials, different kinds of things that need to be used because you need to pour chemical, you need to do polish, each step is different. And once you finish manufacturing, you take wafer level packaging, you actually cut the dye right? and you actually package it into a particular device that you go and buy out. And then they need to be mounted on top of a printed circuit board or a PCB. What KLA does is in every single one of these steps, in, a, in addition to the IC manufacturing, we actually make tools. And at each step, the trade off with accuracy and precision is different and throughput is different. But fundamentally, all the tools enable you to do process control at different steps of the manufacturing system. Okay. So, where do we sit in the electronics industry and why do we say that we affect everybody's world, right? Right at the bottom are the companies that you know the Apples of the world, the Samsung of the world, the IBM, the HPs, who actually sell end products to customers. Now, these end products are made up, made up of semiconductors. These semiconductors are manufactured in the factories that are shown in the second layer from the bottom. Your TSMCs of the world, Global Foundries, Micron, Intel, even India is trying to pitch for its own semiconductor manufacturing and all those come over there. Now, the factories are full of equipment supplied by the wafer fab equipment manufacturers, applied materials, ASML, LAM research, etc. And those tools that are actually manufacturing are checked or their process is controlled by the tools manufactured by companies like KLA, ASML and applied. So, the impact of a tool that we have goes all the way down all the way to the electronics industry. And in fact, there are some steps in the manufacturing process which manufacture which, which typically happens in factories that are kilometers long. There are some steps which for which only KLA produces tools. Okay. And these tools are fundamentally an image processing tool because you do not have an electrically testable circuit. Take an image process it, check it against a reference. We will talk a little bit about that example. So, this is the kind of impact that we have from KLA. So, this is a negative of a tool. I do not know how many of you can see it because it is a little small, but essentially you know it really is a multidisciplinary engineering tool. It is a it is it is a feat of engineering in my opinion, right? Because the factory in which these semiconductors are manufactured are about 10,000 times cleaner than an operating theatre. And I am sure enough of you have seen enough TV to understand how clean one needs to be to go to an operating theatre. And these things are 10,000 times cleaner than that. So, a single speck or defect can really ruin your entire wafer. And these tools, you know, our tools are sitting inside that to make sure that you find those defects. I will show you some examples. So, the tool that we have is a combination of, like I said, it is basically a very advanced microscope. So, we have lasers illuminating it. For some tools, we have electron beams also illuminating it to get much higher resolution at lower throughput. We have on the right side, you will see this broadband plasma illumination where we use plasma to actually illuminate the entire wafer. That is how we generate light and that plasma glows actually hotter than the sun, so about 50,000 Kelvin and that generates wavelength that helps us inspect. Once you do the inspection, you get the wave, you get the reflected and the refracted and the transmitted light out. You need to control it, you need to collect them for which we have image sensors and cameras to actually collect the, the, the reflected and the refracted light. And with that, with that we are able to try and we are going to try and do some image processing on top of that by using high speed data processing and high performance computing. And what runs is actually your AI, your algorithms that leverage machine learning, deep learning and that do computational physics. Right. What I will focus on today here is really the algorithms, the AI algorithms because I believe quite a few of you here are IDD students. How many of you here are dual degree data science? What are the other disciplines that I have here that if you did not raise your hand, maybe you can tell me a little bit about what your, uh, some MS in computer science I believe, MSc, what are the other, I saw MSc, 
MSC data science, wonderful, right? So, I will focus a little bit more on the AI algorithms. We will talk a little bit about HPC. What about others? Any others represented here? Anybody who is not MSC data science or uh, IDDD? That is the crowd. Okay, great. So, I will we'll focus more on the AI, right? So, where the more fun this is. Well. Okay. But this is, you know, the, all this is inside a tool. So, it is like a supercomputer sitting inside a tool which is about half the size of this room. It is a pretty fun uh, feat of engineering, I would say. So, I am going to talk a little bit about how we actually use big data to see tiny things, right? And when we say tiny things, I really mean tiny things. And I say big data, I mean really big data. So, the challenge with why this is so difficult is because of this. The structures that are getting manufactured are one of these three categories of structures. On the left side, you actually see what a modern day transistor looks like. How many of you have taken a transistor class in electrical engineering? Remember what a transistor is. Some of you, nobody. Remember an N, N junction, P junction, look very simple, right? Today, the transistor looks like this on the left side, the gate all around transistor. Looks very different from what it was started in school. The middle guy, the NAND, is the latest NAND technology that powers your flash drives today. It is a very tall and very narrow structure. It looks very different from a memory cell that we studied with 6 transistor SRAM or DRAM in our school, 1 transistor DRAM. On the right side is a lithography, it is a uh, EUV lithography as a reticle that you actually see what the reticle looks like. Right? Those shapes that are there are very intricate to make sure that you get the right manufacturing. And these are really small and really complex patterns. Now, within these, what we are looking for is that little blue thing. I do not know how many of you can even see it if I do not zoom in got a squint over there, right? This is an example of a 3D NAND structure within which there is a little blue defect. Even at this scale with the naked eye, I cannot see it from here, right? I need to see the zoomed image and I barely see it. So, this is really the extent to which you are looking at, right? Now, in addition to finding defects, what we are also interested in variation. As I told you, when you try to draw a straight line, it is no longer a pure straight line. But what we have is some variation. So, for example, here on the third tube, you actually see that on the third, on this tube here, we are trying to manufacture a vertical cylindrical column, but you actually get a shape that is slightly different. However, it might be acceptable, maybe it is okay. Right? So, what we have is we have tools that measure variation that could affect IC performance and that is a metrology tool. And all of this is primarily done with image processing. Right? What we are running is an image processing algorithm and today those image processing algorithms are augmented by AI. And to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, I do not think, I, okay, I have this, right? To give you an idea of the problem, let me show you an example of one of our tools in action. It will give you some uh, idea of scale. So, this is an example of a KLA tool that you see over here. The orange boxes that you see are called cassettes, which hold about to 25 wafers. The cassette is the minimum uh, granularity at which wafers move inside a fab. Fab is like a fact, it is like a, it is like Disneyland for me to see, right? Because these, Wafers move by robots, they moved on top, it is beautifully uh, set up. Once a cassette comes into our tool, there is a mechanical arm inside that takes the cassette out and it starts processing. So, the wafer comes in from the cassette and it starts processing. It goes through our tool and from our tool, typically what we do is with a heavy amount of sampling, lot of statistical simplification, we generate on an average 10 billion pixels in a 100 micrometer square area in a single scan. Okay. Now, these numbers normally are a little confusing. So, let me give you some real numbers. Right? So, in some of our tools, we generate about 4 petabytes of data in about 8 hours of operation. 8 hours is one tool shift. Okay. And then in reference, all Facebook users in the world in 24 hours generate 4 petabytes of data. One point or one tool in 8 hours single shift generates as much data as all 2.5 billion Facebook users generate in an entire day. And from that 4 petabytes of data, the kind of errors which correspond to this 10 billion pixels, what we are looking for are defects of this granularity. Again, you might have to squint quite a bit to see those defects that I have pointed out over here. Right? There is actually a bridge in the first figure between two lines that are supposed to be parallel and not connected. That is a short circuit. Circuit will not work. The second thing, I have actually fought quite a bit with my uh, apps guys to say that they say they can spot variation from circle to circle on the second figure. I cannot see it. 
but I do not have a trained eye, right? Our tools can see it. So, these are the kind of defects. Again, this we are trying to sift out from 10 billion pixels, 4 petabytes of data, and this happens day in and day out, hour in and hour out. This is what when I say we are trying to see it's tiny things with big data, this is really what I mean. So, you can imagine the kind of filtering, the kind of noise filtering that we need to do to find this defects out. Right? And then think about the amount of processing that needs to happen to actually make sure that this is indeed a defect and that I am not showing some noise, right. The key innovation that we actually use is we do something called optical inspection which is a way by which you can actually take an image and do image processing to find this. The alternate way to do this or prior to KLA the way that used to be done was using electron beams which give you a 1 nanometer resolution. So, it is fantastic resolution, but it takes you a lot of time to find even 1 pixel. Optical tools are about 10,000 times faster but the image resolution is extremely poor. I will show you some examples. So, from optical to be able to find these defects is the challenge and that is what KLA specialist at. Okay. Any questions so far? Sounds like an interesting problem. You are curious where AI comes to this whole thing, right? I see a few faces saying, why are you talking about all this? Let us talk about some AI. So, the main thing with our tool right now is that we actually have solutions with AI that are actually deployed in field. So, we have tools that leverage AI that are working in the factories as we speak to make sure that our tools are able to identify defects at you know really, really high precision. I will give you some examples. So, here are some of the algorithms that we work on, right. Uh, we work across the bucket as you can imagine. We do a lot of classification because typically we need to classify is this, um, you, you get a pixel, right. So, you are curious is this a background or a foreground image? If this is foreground image, is this noise or is this not noise? what class does this belong to right is this a line is this a you know circle you are trying to draw etc typically so there is a lot of classification algorithms you use typical random forest boosted decision trees mlp cnns all the classifiers that you can think of we play with them one of the most common problems that we have because we are doing image processing right Ima remember image processing what do you do you have two images you are trying to find the difference between them you do a minus b right so the B here is the image under test which you have just captured, but to be able to find what is the original you have to do a reference generation, right. So, for this we use conditional GANs, I will give you, we will actually talk a little bit more about GANs, I am going to skip that over. So, a lot of natural grouping and clustering that we actually have to do because you have a group of pixels you have to find out okay, which of these correspond to one structure or is this something else, this is a defect. And therefore, in our tools we actually actively work, work on CNNs that leverage uh, that operate at a pixel level. We do a lot of physics based AI where we know that the tool has physics that make the images behave a certain way. For example, we have light that is 192 nanometers, resolution is lambda by 2. We know that, we know the size of the pixel. So, there is no use if you are using AI or a deep learning model to make it learn that it is a 192 nanometer light. So, we use that as a prior or we give it as an input. And so that, so that the our networks become simpler. So, a lot of our deep learning, a lot of our machine learning is what we call as physics based AI and that is pretty um, phenomenal for us because it simplifies our model. Again, when you are doing image processing, if you know that the sky is blue, you do not want the algorithm to learn the sky is blue, just tell it the sky is blue. So, you save on that compute, you can do something more sophisticated, that is the idea. So, in this lecture, what I am going to talk a little bit about is how we do reference generation using conditional GANs. Okay, so, let us jump into the problem. So, let us say that you know you took a tool, uh, this is an output of an electron beam tool. So, it is actually very high resolution, the resolution here is 1 nanometer, that is why the image looks so good. You might think why is it saying it looks good, it is all jagged right. This is actually what the manufactured image looks like. So, you take, took a wafer, it is a real image from a real tool on a real wafer. So, you find that this is the patch that the tool gave you and you want, and you want to say okay, you know what I need to find if there is a defect here. So, how do you do it? You try to find a reference, right. What is an obvious reference that you can use? There is a design. So, the manufacturing was done based on a design. So, you go back to the design and you say okay, you know what? In the circuit, this red square that is plotted there is the actual reference for the patch that you have captured. It looks really different, right, because that is all beautifully straight lines, manufacture is nowhere close, right. So, you then say okay, let me actually manufacture the circuit without any defects and let me take the image. You see what the defect free image looks like, right. So, the manufactured, manufactured circuit is very different from the original design because of quantum effects. 
straight lines are no longer straight lines. So the question really is, how do you get a good reference? That's a very big challenge, right? You can't use a circuit because if you do A minus B with a circuit, it's going to look terrible, right? There's just you know every every little difference over here will show up as a defect, but it's not a real defect. The alternate is to actually use the scanning electron microscope or the SIM to actually generate each defect free image and each patch, but that's too slow. You cannot afford to do that for every layer. And this is where we actually turn to GANs to help us generate a reference. So how do you do this? You take a bunch of circuits, you take the corresponding SIM images as ground truth and you train a conditional GAN to generate given a circuit what the SEM image is expected to be like. So here is an example of a circuit, the corresponding SEM image and the output from a generated image. This is the output of a particular GAN. So you actually see that the GAN is able to capture a lot of subtleties that are very non-trivial. For example, you can see in this image, right, this fork, this fork and this fork are perfectly symmetric. However, in the manufacturer, this fork remains symmetric but these two are no longer symmetric and the GAN is actually able to capture these subtleties. Right? Yeah. The ground truth is done by actually capturing on the tool. So that is very slow but that is done offline. So we do not do that because the GAN is trained offline. So we do not have to do that capture online. So we have sample wafers that we have in our labs. With that we can capture the generated uh, ground truth and we can use that for training. Yes, it will be very slow to do it on the fly. That is the challenge. Yeah. So this is a good example you know of, of how we leverage the GAN to generate an image which can be used then as a reference. And now we you know with this circuit. Uh, with a trained GAN, we can actually take the patch which you are interested in and for that patch you can generate the image. You can generate what the expected image is supposed to be in the manufactured circuit. You take the defect image and then you can do a defect detector. Now the defect detector could also be a very simplistic traditional image processing based detector or could be another deep learning detector. I am not talking about details here but you get the idea right where you actually train it saying okay, given A minus B, what is the expected error supposed to be. So what actually deep learning enables us to do is because of doing this, we can significantly reduce what we call as nuisance of false height. For example, without deep learning, when I actually look at a particular wafer map, right? So this is a wafer map where each square is a die. Each dot here is a suspected event. So our tool at the end of it will actually give you the suspected event. And just, you know, these are 5000 events or these are 5000 places that I think it is a problem, right? Then what you do is you go to the SEM, the, there is a process engineer who is sitting in the field who goes to the scanning electron microscope and at every location he or she goes and verifies is this particular location a defect of interest or DOI or is this, or is this location a nuisance or is this you know not important right and then they classify the DOI. So the pink bar here shows what happens with the current or what used to happen without our deep learning models where you actually see that a large fraction of the events that our tools used to output were actually nuisance. And the reason why it was nuisance is because it is very difficult to di distinguish them using traditional means. And when we started using deep learning, what happens is a large percentage of the defects that we actually output are indeed defects of interest. There still is a nuisance, there still is some defects that are actually low which we want to eliminate, but it is significantly better than what the current POR was. So that is what we are really trying to push. Another example where I showed you the last block if you remember right where you have two reference images that you can generate and you can do A minus B and you can find the defect. So we try here, I will try to show you what happens when you use a traditional algorithm for that defect detector as opposed to use a physics based AI solution. So here I have two images, one with a, uh, one with a, a fault and one without the fault right and there is a zoomed version that you can see secondary. You can see that there is a little bit of a bridge that is what we are trying to find out. If you use the generated defect image compared to the defect under test, you actually see that if you see this heat map that you see on the traditional algorithms which in which every light blue dot is expected to be a defect. But for that defect detector, if I use a physics based AI, I am not talking about the algorithm here because you know you can, there are several ways by which you can do this, one of the algorithms I am showing here is we are actually able to narrow down to where the where the defect actually is by leveraging AI. So this is the kind of impact that AI is really having right where our tools continue to do image processing at a very fundamental level 
but they are leveraging AI in places where we can augment image processing, right? And our cats and dogs are different from the cats and dogs that the other cloud people actually process because our images are more manufactured images, they are more SEM images that do not look like your traditional natural images. So, not all the algorithms that work for the outside world sometimes works for us, but that typically turns out to be a good starting point for us to go and optimize. Okay. Any questions on this particular uh, section before I move a little bit more into the compute? No? Okay. So, next what I will do is I will talk a little bit about how we make these algorithms actually run on our tool and what kind of high performance computing we do to actually make these run. Now, while as data scientists you typically do not think about this, this is a very important aspect to consider because for example, if you take the large language models today that are deployed in the world, right? Just to give you an idea of scale, the amount of money that an artist in India makes on an hourly basis on an average is about 20 rupees an hour. The amount of money that it takes to run a large language model to answer to your chat GPT queries is 200 rupees an hour on an average. So, running these models on the cloud or running these models is not cheap. Right? So, it is very important to understand how the model ties to the hardware, how to make it run and therefore, you have to sometimes influence the choice of your algorithms or to simplify your algorithms so that the hardware cost is not exorbitant. Because today one of the biggest limitation with deploying and the biggest limitation adopting AI is while the results are very impressive in its accuracy, the cost is exorbitantly high. Right? So, it becomes very difficult to actually use. So, this is an important aspect for us as well. So, what I will talk about here is the computation stack that actually takes in these images that come the 4 petabytes and how do you actually process it to get the output. Right? It all starts of course, with our uh, sensors or optics which is either 200 to 1000 nanometers if it is optical or 1 nanometer if it is scanning electron microscope or SEM. We have these high speed sensors that are collecting data at the rate of 1 to 50 gigabytes per second where you collect this data and then and then we have a computer, uh, we have a computing stack right which is essentially a supercomputer that is sitting inside our tool and the supercomputer takes all this data and starts processing them. What do you do when you process them? We have this thing called the IMC which is the image computer, it stands for image computer. You first take the raw input which is in the form of graphs, you know data because your sensor has collected all this data. You get an image like this with an optical detection, okay. So far you have been seeing nice and clean images because the resolution was really, really impressive. But when you actually do an optical image, this is what the image looks like. And what we see here is actually blinking between two images which are reference and test. And from this you are expected to actually find what the defect is. And once you say okay, this is a potential defect site, what then happens is the process engineer takes it, puts it into scanning electron microscope and gets the image on top, which has obviously much, much better resolution on what the optical has, right. And sometimes and hopefully most of the time, the SEM says yes, what you actually output was indeed a defect and sometimes it says it is not a defect, in which case your optical tool failed, right. So, your hope is that from a tool perspective, you want to get as many defects as possible and get as few no defects as possible. That is when people start believing that your output is actually correct, okay. Once you find the defects, what is interesting is you need to do a classification again. You, we use AI based classifiers for it to say what kind of defect is it? Is it a bridge defect? Is it other, de other types of real defect? Different bins, right? What these bins correspond to is with these bins, we can say that for this particular wafer, we have so many bridge defects, we have so many line defects. The process engineer takes this takes this output and goes and checks the tool that is actually doing the manufacturing is that tool, does that tool have to be tweaked in some way to avoid these defects. Again, this is where process control comes in, right. You cannot eliminate all the defects, but you want to make sure that if the defects are important, you can go and manip, you can go and tweak the parameters of the tool such that you do not have this defect anymore, okay. Now, in this what kind of processing do we do? Our our stack to capture the images is actually we have an ASIC and an FPGA that actually does this in real time because the data rates 1 to 50 gigabytes per second is astronomically higher than anything that we have that we see out there to actually handle this. So, we have an ASIC and an FPGA which actually are custom built by KLA to be able to capture this. Then 
your FPGA again like I said is doing near real time processing. We have GPU and CPU based SIMD operations to do the bulk processing on this data, to do all the AI algorithms, to do the image processing, to be able to find with the optical image if there is a defect or not, right. This include your noise suppression, this include your classification, all kinds of algorithms, image processing, AI, whatever. Once we have that, we then go to the SEM. On the SEM, we then have to do classification again. So for that, we have both CPU and GPU because data is very structured. We do SIMD and MIMD based processing. So an active area of research for us is we've had a lot of traditional CPU algorithms that have been running on the CPU for a long time. We're slowly starting to migrate these to the GPU. Now, as we start migrating these to the GPU, there are different class of algorithms that have different gains. On the one hand, we have these deep learning algorithms, you know, where we see 5x to 10x gains when you move from CPU to GPU. Again, from an algorithm perspective, the deep learning algorithm is fantastic, right? But as you can see, to get them to actually run well and in real time at the speeds that we want, we need the GPU. The GPU tends to be more expensive than CPU. So you have to consider what the impact of using these algorithms is. But deep learning is not the only thing that our tool runs, right? We also run a lot of traditional image processing. These image processing are also a matrix matrix kind of work where we do two different images. There we still see some gain from the GPU, not as much as we see from deep learning, but it's still pretty decent. Now in addition, we also have a lot of your principal component analysis, SVD decomposition, 2D histograms, small matrix solvers, which also are algorithms that our tools run. And those, when you move them to the GPU, because these tend to be vector based arithmetic, are not as high a gain as I see with deep learning. We see more in the 2 to 4x gain. And finally, we also do a lot of uh, EM solvers and uh, you know, we do a lot of Maxwell equation solvers, a lot of physics based regressions. Those tend to also should see slightly lower benefit when compared to deep learning models when you move to the GPU. However, net net what we are finding right now is there is a lot of benefit from moving from the CPU to the GPU and an active area of work for us is to understand when we actually leverage an algorithm, what is the impact of that algorithm on the computation and choose the right computation to be able to run with that particular algorithm so that we have a fully you know coherently designed system. We do not have an algorithm that is going to take days to run and you need the result in minutes that is not going to work. So doing a system level impact is actually very important. Yeah. So towards this we are doing a lot of active investigations into our GPUs to support our accelerator algorithms. We do a lot of work with NVIDIA of course NVIDIA being the market leader a lot of work actively with NVIDIA. But there are other companies also putting out GPUs that are interesting there is AMD, there is Intel and you know there are several other specialized computations including accelerators that are focused on AI that are interesting for us. The focus for us again is not just on the hardware or on the software. The focus is on doing a combined system level R&D right to cover system level solution so that it is holistically the co-designed software and hardware to get the optimal performance. That is really what we want. But one of the major challenges that we are running into and this is an active area of research for us is that getting performance on hardware today is not easy. Okay, these are slides courtesy of Professor Uday from IASC where when we look at ML and look at the landscape of AI, there are lots of frameworks on top. Whether it be a TensorFlow, it be a PyTorch, it be Keras APIs in TensorFlow, right, it be ONNX, there are several options and there is lots of hardware underneath. We have Intel, AMD, C, AMD. Um, NVIDIA of course, we have a lot of other vendors who are providing accelerators. How do you get from top to bottom without being, you know, with it being seamless? Today in fact, unfortunately the only way to get very good performance is to get these ninja coders. And these ninja programmers basically write software to run on the hardware by understanding what the hardware is capable of. These are the folk who can write CUDA, who can read assembly or write pretty much in what you can call as assembly for the GPU which is CUDA programming. Right. But that is not scalable because it is a lot of time and it is not modular and you cannot port it from one GP to another you have to rewrite all your software which is not the idea when you wrote for example Python code. If you write TensorFlow code you do not want to write different versions for every GPU it is not an idea. Right. So an active area of research for us is we are actively looking into leveraging MLIR based compilers which is the next generation of compilers to replace these hand tuned codes. So this is also an active area that we are actively working on. Now, I am not diving too much into these specifics because I thought for this audience it might not be interesting. But if anybody has any questions on this or on the hardware, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask. I am happy to answer anything there. Okay, if there is no questions, 
is going to move forward. So, this pretty much brings me to the end. I'm a little early. Again, if you have questions, feel free to ask me. So, as I think all of you are aware, especially through the pandemic, we heard a lot about the semiconductors becoming an important, uh, you know, critical part of the global economy. And especially with India putting a lot of emphasis on semiconductor manufacturing, which is becoming of very, very high importance in India. Our tools are re have really enabled scaling of Moore's law, right? Doubling performance every 18 months, doubling number of transistors has been enabled by process control because manufacturing cannot be accurate. But our tools make sure that as long as you can control the process, can continue to get good yield. So we have really been instrumental in enabling Moore's law to scale. And we have started using really cutting edge AI and HPC technologies to keep progressing. So that is something that you know we have been doing it for a while and it is only accelerating as I see it moving forward. If you have any questions or if you need more information, feel free to reach out to me on the technical side, non-technical, whatever you have. I will leave you with a you know a thought of how we help control our own destiny. It is pretty cool. So we use AI towards enabling the tools towards building inspectors and metrology tools that is used for better chip manufacturing. Now through these better chip manufacturing, we get better chips and through the better chips, we get better high performance computing with which you can run our AI models better. So we end up by controlling our destiny because we end up helping making the computers that help, up, help us make better algorithms and computers going forward. So it is a pretty nice way to think about you know the whole circle of life that we see affecting ourselves and pretty exciting. So I will just leave you with a couple of pictures about you know our operations in Chennai. We have been here since 2005. We have over 700 employees spread across three campuses. On the bottom right, oh, hopefully some of you recognize that is IIT Madras Research Park. My lab is based out of IIT Research Park. We have a couple of other offices in uh, Chennai as well. The picture at the bottom is actually an old picture. I do not think all of us will fit in that, in that smaller picture anymore. If you have any more questions, again feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we are coming on campus actually this week for hiring. We have uh, internship drives for next year's summer interns. If you are interested, uh, please participate. Hopefully, you can write the test and be coming for interviews as well. That is pretty much all I had for today. If there are any further questions, I am happy to take them. I will hang around here after this as well if anybody wants to come up and talk to me. Any questions?